Please open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19. And if you stand, I'll again be reading verses 1 through 12 as we uh, are working our way carefully through Jesus' clear uh, exposition of Scripture, his presentation of the truth about marriage and about divorce, a question that certainly is intensely important in, was intensely important in Jesus' day and certainly is intensely important in our own. Matthew 19, beginning with verse 1. When Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, then it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not all men can accept this statement. <clears throat> but only those for whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. There are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. There are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He was able to accept this. Let him accept it. Please be seated. <clears throat> now data from a recent study indicate that by age 20, 77% of Americans have been engaged in some form of sexual intimacy. 75%, that was premarital sexual involvement. 12% had been married by that time. By age 44, however, 95% of the respondents had been involved in premarital sexual activity. Even among those who abstained until at least age 20, 81% had had premarital sex by age 44. Surveys also show us that 22% of married men have committed an adulterous act at least once in their life. 14% of married women have had affairs at least once during their married lives. Now, as we've discussed before, we live in an age of no-fault divorce. That is, where divorce is literally allowed for any reason at all. And this disease has affected the church. It's resulted in a tsunami of divorces which are harmful and unbiblical. However... We also live in a time when adultery and sexual sins are on the rise as well, tugging at the very fabric of marriage, harming it terribly. So how do we protect and guard marriage in times such as these? There's only one way, and that is by rigorously, joyfully, and righteously living according to biblical standards in our marriages and applying those biblical standards to every issue of marriage and divorce within the church. This means that individual believers, the church as a whole, And the leadership of the church must work in careful concert to protect and to guard marriage in every possible way. What we'll see again this morning is that Jesus is the king who powerfully defends the biblical definition of marriage by properly interpreting the scriptures and carefully explaining its implication for marriage and divorce. Again, Jesus is the king who powerfully defends the biblical definition of marriage by properly interpreting scripture and carefully explaining its implications for marriage and divorce. The guidelines for marriage and divorce are clearly articulated in the word of God and they are sufficient to deal with every marriage issue. There is nothing that the Bible does not give us the the tools to handle. The truth of the word of God and the spirit of God working within us and it is essential that we work our way through these things, that we understand how to do this, because this affects the church at its most fundamental level, the nature of marriage, the nature of male and female, the very nature of our sexuality and how we express that. It is vital that we understand how to properly interpret and use the word of God in this area. Now, in Matthew 19, remember, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's almost there. In Jerusalem, he will suffer. He will be be killed on a cross, he will be buried, he will rise again the third day. He's told his disciples this, he's headed to really, to to do what he came to do as the Messiah, and as he does that, the Pharisees are trying to discredit him. He's stealing their audience, as it were, he's taking their authority, he's removing them from the equation, and so they want to discredit him so that the people will turn against him. So they're constantly asking him questions, and in this iteration, verse 3, the Pharisees come to Jesus and they're testing him, remember. 
right? He's been healing the people, caring for them, showing that he is the Messiah, displaying his compassion and power. They could care less. All they want to do is discredit him so they can get their own power back. And so they, the motive for this question is to trip him up. And really, they've laid a, a scriptural challenge for him. They think they've got him here, I think. They know he's going to use scripture. They know that Jesus, that was his modus operandi. That's what he did. He always used the Bible. So they're going to do the same. Say, so we can do that too. And they're going to try to lay a scriptural trap, which will then discredit Jesus, really demonstrating that he's not the Messiah because he disagrees with the truth of scripture. That's what they're going to try to show. Well, the content of the question then was divorce for any reason lawful. That is what they essentially believed. Look, you get get divorced for any reason, right? No matter what it was, the man was in charge of this. The question here is all about men. What can men do? Now, in our day and age, both men and women can divorce. So it applies equally to both men and women today. It applied the same back then, but there was no such thing as a woman getting divorced. You weren't allowed to do that. It was against the law. So it's men abusing women, essentially, is what's going on in this divorce process for the most part. And you had the rabbis debating back and forth between, amongst themselves, what's the proper interpretation of Deuteronomy 24? And remember, we looked at that last week, where Moses permits a, a certificate of divorce. Actually, he commands that a certificate of divorce be written, but that's a permission of the divorces which are taking place, not a command, as we will see. So... Jesus answers their question, and the argument that he brings is an appeal to the scriptures. Remember, he appeals to Genesis 1 and 2. He says, look, God designed marriage for a particular purpose. And he really built his, his creatures, he built human beings so they could engage in marriage, so they could become one flesh. He made them male and female. And then look at verse 5, it says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother. For what reason? They're male and female. So they can leave their father and mother's house. They can cleave together in this one flesh covenant union. Remember that the sexual union is a picture of that one flesh nature that is, is viewed by God as a permanent union. Again, one flesh has more to do with it than only the sexual union, but it's not less than that. And that's that, that, that physical intimacy is a picture of the, of the uh, communication, of the covenant, of the permanency of by which God views marriage. And remember, that's what Jesus appeals to in, in verse 6. As he's making his summary statement, right? God designed male and female. He designed them to be married. He designed this to be a one flesh union. That's why sexuality is to be expressed in marriage as a picture of this one flesh and nowhere else because it violates the picture. If it's not male and female, it violates the picture. There's only one way this can work in the eyes and the economy of God, regardless of what men say. But then he he summarizes all that in verse 6. He says, so they are no longer two but one flesh. I mean, have you not gotten this? They come together. They're supposed to become one flesh. As they do that, God views them that way. They are one flesh. This is a permanent union. He says, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Marriage is not a human institution. We don't determine it. The people getting married don't determine it. God is the one who determines it. And when they come together as one flesh to make this covenant union, God views it as that. It is permanent. Right? As long as they are, uh, are living, as long as they're on this earth, that's a permanent union. So that's the summary. We also discussed even the bigger picture. Further revelation in the book of Ephesians reveals to us that this marriage is a, is a picture of Christ in the church. There's an even bigger picture involved. The beautiful intimacy and care that Christ exhibits towards his church and their love back in return for him. Marriage pictures that. And to violate that picture as though somehow Christ and the church weren't permanent would be a further violation of this, of this merit, of this view of, that God has of the permanence of marriage. Well, then the Pharisees spring their trap. They give the rebuttal. We started that last week, and that's on your outline. The rebuttal to the king's teaching is what? They said to him, and without a beat, right? they knew what was coming, I think. And so they've got this all ready. They said, but wait a minute. Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Now, by the way, Moses wrote both Genesis 1 two and three, and he also wrote Deuteronomy. Now, it's God writing through Moses. We understand that, but he's the author of both of those. All right, so, so there's no, the author is the same. Saying, well, why did, why did Moses it, later on say that a man uh, should? He commanded to give a certificate of divorce and send her away. And again, that's a quote from Deuteronomy 24, and Jesus doesn't miss a beat either. See, what they're saying is, yeah, we know that's what was said in Genesis 1 and 2, but what is said in Deuteronomy 24 countermands that. God, through Moses, is bringing us a further command. Hey, it's okay to divorce. I didn't really mean that it was permanent, right? Because it doesn't say directly in Genesis that it is permanent. That is, that there's no way. It doesn't talk about divorce at all. So the exception really becomes the rule. Right? That is Deuteronomy 24, where he allows a certificate of divorce, really means that God commanded them to divorce when they desired to do so, that there was a command. Well, Jesus says, you, you've misunderstood. You have applied your hermeneutics wrongly. Right? Look on the back of your bulletin just for a moment. 
Okay, you will see there a hermeneutics weekend, a digging deeper. And, and, and I, I do this purposely because well, as in the middle of this discussion about hermeneutics and how you probably understand the Bible, you're like, well, why do we need to do that? I mean, it should become pretty obvious. If you get your view of marriage wrong and the permanency of marriage wrong, then that affects everything you do. It affects how you enter into marriage, affects how you might exit marriage, affects how you would counsel everybody. And our young people need to know this. And even more than just knowing about the principle in Scripture, they need to know how to understand or how to derive the principle themselves. We're feeding, not just feeding them fish, as it were, we're teaching them how to fish. We're not just feeding them Bible information, we're teaching them how to draw the Bible information out for themselves. And you need to learn the same thing. So come join us. We're going to spend Friday night talking about advanced and basic hermeneutics. In fact, if you're a homeschooler and you want to send your kids, you get grammar credit. You have to know what nouns are, verbs are, adjectives are, because that's how grammar works, and the Bible works according to grammar, and so you have to understand those things to interpret it properly. You have to know precedence principles. What's the foundational principle? I mean, if it's all the Bible, remember, this is an intra-Bible debate that Jesus and the Pharisees are having. They're not saying Shammai said this. They're saying Shammai interpreted the Bible this way. This is what the Bible actually says. So it's an intramural debate, as it were over a very important topic. So we're going to teach our teens that, and then we're going to wake them up in the morning if they stay here, if they come, and we're going to talk about genres of Scripture. How do you interpret parables? How do you interpret wisdom literature? How do you look at prophecy? How do you do those things? And we're going to look at a Bible study method. We're going to look at the tools that are out there, rich tools. I mean, we've never had tools like this in the history of the world. Nobody should get the Bible wrong. Let me just say it that way. Nobody. There's no excuse. Because of all the tools that we have, so we're going to teach them that, and then we're going to give them an opportunity to put that into practice and do a little presentation at the end. You ought to come. You ought to do that. You ought to join. You ought to be part of the presentation. Right? It's kind of a, a one week or, or a two day intensive as to a year of LBI or a year of SI or some of these other things that you're learning. So you can turn your bulletins back over and keep do an outline again. But uh, I'm just simply saying that that's what's going on here and that this is not a minor issue. Jesus is doing hermeneutics. He's digging deeper. He's teaching them how to understand the Bible. He says, you got it wrong. Jesus didn't command divorce. I mean, we read the passage. Nor does it say you ought to divorce your wives, you should divorce your wives if you just think anything about them that you don't like, any indecency. He's permitting you to divorce because you're hard-hearted, because you hate your wives, you hate God. You, are, are, you want your own desire. So you are divorcing them. So really the command or the prescription in that passage was one, that they do write a certificate of divorce. That was necessary so that the women weren't left on their own. The man couldn't just reclaim them again. Or they're kind of stuck in limbo and they can't remarry. It was to be a certificate of divorce so they could get married again because they were completely without resource in a society dominated by men. And you had to be married in order to be protected and guarded. So he's saying, look, that's the, the command is, is one, that there would be that certificate that had to be made legal, even though the divorce itself was wrong, it had to be made legal so that the woman wouldn't be harmed. And additionally, the, the full command in that passage was once a woman is married to another man, if, they, if, she, if she's divorced then, He's not to go back. She's not to go back to the previous man. That, that's, that's ungodly. You don't just wife swapping. But no command was there to divorce. It was a permission because their hearts were hard. And so Jesus and he says, but from the beginning, it's not been that way. Right? That isn't what the original principle was designed to promote. And so we don't do values clarification when we study scripture. We don't take the exception for sin particularly and apply it to the rule. We take the rule and learn how to deal with the exceptions. Now, as I've said, it can be difficult to figure out which one is the rule, which is the exception. And progressive revelation helps us with that. But remember that there are foundational principles that progressive revelation, and certainly even with exceptions, doesn't change them. So progressive revelation doesn't change prior principles. It might might give us greater clarity. There might be things like understanding that the Mosaic law itself is undone because it was an old covenant. There's things like that. And so that can be difficult, but always we have to understand the original meaning and then make the proper application. The Pharisees got it wrong. Why? Because they read their own desires into the text. All right? they, they're doing desirable exegesis, lustful exegesis. They're reading their own lusts in, not just with their own intellect. They're not just saying, this is the way you know, we interpret it uh, because we have all these good Bible principles. No, this is the way we interpret it because this is what we want. And so we'll find a way to get our interpretation out of the passage. I mean, does that sound familiar? You've, you, might, you might have done it. It's amazing how people will switch their views on marriage divorce depending on which side they're on. If they've been divorced, or they'll switch. All of a sudden, oh, no, it's this. Well, it wasn't that before. Why is it now? Because that's what they want. All right, so we, we need to be very careful here. So the king brings his clarification. They bring their rebuttal, and he clarifies it. And in one sense, I don't want to make this more complex. The, the rebuttal's very simple. 
Now, there's complexities in it, and we're going to have to get enmeshed in them. We're, we're going to do that. We're going to spend a lot of time today doing that, and some time next week. And well, we have to do that because the, the details of this are important. But don't, let's, again, let's not lose the forest for the trees. The rebuttal is very simple. If you get married or if you get divorced, for anything other than immorality, it's a sin. And to get remarried after being divorced sinfully is adultery. I mean, there's your principle. And it clears up much of the debate. Everything else that you would want to get divorced over is unacceptable. Right? Any other indecency, that is, any other thing that you don't like, even, even the difficulties and wrestles of a hard marriage are not going to give you an exception. Now, I will point ahead to, to, to this will be next week or the week after, we will discuss issues of abuse and unbelievers. We'll, we'll, we'll go there. But right now, Jesus' principle is very simple. Anything other than adultery, right? and if you get divorced for anything other than that, it is a sin, and you cannot remarry. If you do, you are committing adultery. So, so that's relatively simple. So let's just work our way through it. He said, I say to you. And when he says, I say to you, he's not undoing Moses. This is God again speaking, right? Jesus speaking. He's just clarifying what's really going on. He said, yeah, Moses permitted that. But you need to understand that those divorces were wrong. If they weren't for adultery, and by the way, they wouldn't have had to write a certificate of divorce because whoever committed the adultery was dead, if that's what had been happening. And so they were free to remarry. So those were sinful divorces, even though Moses was regulating them. And Jesus is just simply reminding them of the original principle. I say to you, regardless of, of what your view of this is, regardless of when a certificate of divorce is necessary, the divorce itself was wrong if it wasn't for immorality. That's, how, that's what he's saying. I say to you. He's not adding, not giving anything new, just going back to the original principle. You cannot get divorced for anything other than and immorality. I say to you, whoever, anyone, without exception, who divorces his wife except for immorality. Again, notice, it is the men who are harming the women. Now, that happens back in reverse today, all right? So that's not a good thing, but in particularly in the society, he's, it's, it's, it's focused on the man. Whoever divorces his wife except for immorality, what does it say? And marries another woman, commits adultery. So your first blank, all divorce except for the case of immorality is sin. It's wrong to get divorced for any reason other than that. And then, therefore, number two, all remarriage except where the divorce was for immorality is wrong and constitutes adultery. You may not get remarried. If you divorce for anything other than immorality, you may not be remarried. If you do, it is adultery. Now, we, we do need to spend a moment on two words here. One, the idea of divorce. What is that? Well, the word here is, it's, it means to, to let loose, to send away, but it's the technical term for terminating a marriage. That's what it means, right? It's used throughout the scriptures. Essentially means the same thing. You are formally terminating the marriage. So whoever formally terminates, not just say has a sexual liaison with someone else and that ends the marriage. That doesn't formally end the marriage. There has to be this formal ending of the relationship. Okay? That's what he's saying. When that happens, right, when he divorces his wife except for immorality, then it's wrong. Now what's immorality? Because you might expect Jesus to say, whoever divorces his wife except for adultery. And a lot of people make a big deal of that. Saying, well, he's not saying adultery. So this word, immorality, means something else. And there's John Piper and others who say, well, then you can't really get divorced or remarried for any reason because he's talking about something, not really talking about marriage. He's talking about kind of a betrothal process. It's a misunderstanding of the word. The word has to do with physical intimacy with someone who's not your spouse. Or actual sexual activity, sexual intimacy with anyone else. Right? That's the idea. And the reason that Jesus uses this general word is he wants to make sure that they don't do what, do what we often do. We say, well, that wasn't technically adultery. That was some other sexual liaison. Because there was different kinds of things. There's prostitution. It's incest. Somehow amazing. Someone would say, well, I didn't commit adultery, technically. Uh, so there's all kinds of ways you might try to get around this. Jesus is just using the most general word. If you have sexual activity, if you're sexually intimate with anyone outside of the marriage bonds, right, then... Divorce is permissible, permissible, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So that's immorality. Now, again, in this word, Greek word, porneia, is translated in the Old Testament, in the Greek translation, all right, the Septuagint, it, trans it translates prostitution, unchastity, fornication, that is sexual activity before marriage, right? I any kind of immoral sexual activity, that's the word you're going to find in the Old Testament, the same in the New but it always has to do almost 100% of the time with actual sexual involvement, one person with another. And that's why he uses it, right? It has to do with sexual intimacy that is improper or immoral sexual intimacy. In fact, it's used in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 of a relationship that was actually going on in the church. 
So it's actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind that does not exist among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. He doesn't call it adultery because it's not exactly that. Some weird, bizarre, you say he's got his father's wife, probably wasn't, it's probably his mother-in-law. I mean, it's weirdness. He might not even have been married. So, you know, what are you going to call that? It's not really adultery, but it's sexual activity. So it's called what? Immorality. I think that helps us understand the broadness of the word, but that it involves sexual contact, physical contact. That's the idea. So, there's much discussion as to what level of immorality would qualify for a divorce, right? I mean, that, that is a discussion. And again, I hate to have to dig into these details, but these things go on all the time. We have to work our way through it. Probably most common today is for people to ask, look, does pornography, that is a man or a woman viewing sexually inappropriate material, does that count? I don't think so. Now, is that a horrible sin? Is it breakup? Is it harmful to a marriage? Is it something that, that needs to be addressed and worked through? Absolutely. But is that the grounds that Jesus is talking about? I don't think, I don't believe so because the word used again has to do with actual sexual activity, sexual contact. And, and please hear me carefully, hear me all the way through so you don't misunderstand me. Again, pornography is a horrible evil, but it is not the same as actual sexual activity with another human being. That carries greater consequences. You would best beat your pornography, and then you'd best move it back into your mind so that it never expresses itself, and then you'd best beat it in your mind. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you somehow say that adultery in the heart is the same as adultery outside of it, then why, why not just go ahead and get engaged in adultery outside of your heart? There are different consequences. Now, before the Lord, you, you'd go to hell for both. God judges you for both, either if, if it's in the heart or out, but don't let it out. Deal with it in. Because once you let it out, it has a whole series of ramifications outside when we've moved into physical sexual activity that are different than it just being in the mind. I hope you're understanding me. It's not acceptable in the mind. But there is a difference in the consequences once it moves outside. And one of those is that if you're married, it is the grounds for the termination of the marriage. It can be. Right? So let's not equate the two to simply, well, if I have adultery in my heart, it's exactly the same as adultery outside. It isn't. Don't do that. Don't do the one in either and continually beat it back till you've defeated it. Until even when it comes into your mind, it's instantly dealt with so that it doesn't become a sin. So I'm giving no excuse for pornography, no excuse for mental adultery. I'm only saying it's not the grounds for divorce. It's not the grounds that Jesus laid out. It's when there's physical sexual activity. It seems to be the best way to understand this. Now, I, I do need to mention one other possibility because our world is weird. And we can do all kinds of strange things when it comes to sexual morality. I would say that it moves a little bit closer to actual immorality, this porneia, when you've, when you've got video things going on, when, when someone is engaging, although not directly physically, they can see the person, they can talk to the person, they are, they are experiencing things through video. Guys, that's about as close as you can get, and that probably counts underneath this. When you, there's an actual other person involved who's participating with you at some level that you can see. I, I've had a pretty hard time saying that's not immorality. Right? Again, there's, there's all kinds of variations here. I'm not going to discuss them all, obviously, but this is the adult sermon. It's not the child sermon. Right? This is, you need to hear this, and you need to know this, and you need to understand this. Even though we're trying to be gentle and careful here, all these things happen, and all these things need to be dealt with, and they all happen within the church. All right, so that's what immorality is. That's why it's an exception, and we'll discuss that uh, in further detail in just a moment, that is what makes it an exception. But that's what the word means. When there is sexual contact physically with someone that's not your spouse, then it is a provision for divorce. Divorce can be pursued if that is the case. However, number two, as I mentioned, all remarriage where that divorce was for immorality, except where the divorce was for immorality, is wrong. So it's a sin, again, if you divorce for any other reason. It's also a sin if you remarry and your divorce was for any other reason. He makes it very clear. He said the same thing Jesus did in Matthew 5. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, again, he makes this exception, as it were. He makes her commit adultery. If he divorces her, and it wasn't for immorality. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Notice, by the way, that remarriage is always implied. There's no such thing as getting divorced and not getting remarried. Now, people can live these days single and all. You couldn't live back then. It was very, very difficult. That was possible, but the general assumption in every case was that there would be the pursuit of remarriage. So he says, look, if you do this wrongly, you've cut off your option for remarriage. Be careful. It's not like you can just do this and then get married again. Okay, because you're committing adultery when you do that. Now, in Mark 10 and Luke 16, Jesus says the same. He just doesn't add in except for unchastity except for adultery. He doesn't put in the exception clause. So some say, well, 
Okay, well, Jesus didn't put that exception clause in Mark 10 and Luke 16, so maybe he means something different. It's not actually an exception. I mean, it's the clearest possible wording. He clearly says that if there has been unchastity, if there's been immorality, that at that point, divorce isn't sin for the innocent party, the one who didn't do that. And this exception, as it were, really is what explains the more general statement made in Mark and Luke. That is, it says, look, Mark didn't mention it, and Luke doesn't mention it. Right? I think it was assumed, but Jesus makes sure, Matthew makes sure that Jesus mentions it so that we can understand what this exception is, and that, that provides grace, as we will see, to the party that is sinned against. Really, it provides grace for both parties. That's why adultery or immorality becomes the exception. And we, again, the clearer principle is what? That there is an exception. And that explains the more, in this case, more general principle when neither Mark nor Luke specifically state it. Jesus did, and Matthew records it. So it's very clear that this exception does exist. Now, before I move on to number three, that is, why, what, what is the innocent party? That is the one who has not committed this immorality. What can they do? Before we do that, let's think about for a moment if you have been divorced improperly. If this is part of your experience, if this is who you are, maybe, maybe here this morning, maybe in the midst of this this morning, a couple of thoughts for you. If this happened before you were a Christian, it was a sin, it was wrong in the eyes of God. But as an unbeliever, everything you did was wrong in the eyes of God. When you come to Jesus seeking repentance for sin, you certainly are forgiven of the sin of immorality and unchastity and adultery and fornication. You're forgiven for those sins. They don't carry over somehow. Now, there might be implications ongoing in marriage and relationships. I get all that and maybe some careful things that need to be worked through. But there's not an ongoing guilt that carries through from unbeliever to believer. You're forgiven for those sins. So it's not some kind of you know, scarlet A that gets stamped on you that somehow you never can recover from. Were you an unbeliever? Well, you committed a lot of other sins. They were all serious. That one is forgiven as well. But what about if you're a believer and you were divorced? You either entered into divorce or the, 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 divorce, the marriage you were part of was broken up. You had a divorce for unbiblical reasons. What are you going to do? You need to repent. If you got remarried and you didn't repent, you didn't recognize this sin of what you did before, you need to repent now. And then you need to stay in that marriage and please and honor the Lord. There is no biblical provision for breaking up a marriage you already have. Even if you entered into it in an adulterous manner, you now, because it was you divorced wrongly, you need to ask for forgiveness. You need to truly repent. And then pursue that marriage in holiness and godliness. But it's not a minor issue. It's a huge issue. Did, have you actually repented of the sin that you were involved in? The fact that you shouldn't, as it were, have entered into that marriage. But I tell you that now the marriage itself is not a sin. You need to stay in it. And it's not like you're committing adultery every time then if you entered into it in an adulterous way. You ask for the forgiveness of the Lord. You repent and you truly repent. And there's people that say, wait a minute, wait. If you tell people that, then they'll just get divorced and then they'll get remarried and they'll say, oh, I repent. They might. I'm not in charge of that. What I am in charge of is telling you what God does when you ask for repentance, and that is he forgives you, and he forgives you every time, and he forgives you fully, and if he does not, what are you to do? And then the rest of us who perhaps might be a little more harsh on you because you committed adultery, and now you are asking for forgiveness, and we're going to hold that against you? What about our own lives? What if God held those things against us? There's full and free forgiveness in Jesus for every sin and adultery and divorce are not the unpardonable sin. They do not keep you from being able to be an active part of the church. There may be other ramifications within the church. There may be. But it has nothing to do with your being an active, full, complete, joyful, participating member of the body of Christ. And somehow it's treated that way. You're pariah. I know pastors who will kind of halfway treat you know, someone who's been married and then divorced and remarried and say, okay, you've asked for forgiveness, but you can't really participate in the church much. What is that? I mean, who are you going to decide? Which sin are we going to do that with? You've done this sin and you repented from that one, but you know, God forgave you mostly for that. He forgives fully, completely, and freely. And I urge you, run to Jesus in repentance and confession if you have divorced wrongly or remarried wrongly, and then live within the state that God commands you to in holiness. And if you need help with that, if you want to know exactly how does this work, then you come, come talk to us. Come talk to the leadership of the church. Come talk to those who can help you with it. True repentance is a joyful and powerful act. Which of you does not need the full forgiveness of God? Every one of you. And so this does not exempt you from that. It has serious consequences, but it does not exempt you from that. Well, third, let's deal with this in detail. 
divorce and remarriage of the innocent party where there has been immorality, some kind of sexual sin, sexual contact, it's not sin. It's not sin to divorce. It's not sin to remarry. It's not adultery to remarry. Again, there's just no other way to, to deal with this text. If it wasn't a sin to get divorced, how can it be a sin to get remarried? It's only a sin, it's only adultery to get remarried if you divorced wrongly. If you're the innocent party, God provides you the grace of this exception. And it is grace, but why? Let's work our way through that. So underneath number three, you're just going to write where, wherever you can. There, there's, no, there's no blanks here. Why does Jesus make an exception for immorality? By the way, this is a tremendous blessing that Jesus does this. So gracious of him to make this clear for us so that we can extend the proper kinds of grace in this incredibly difficult circumstance where someone has been divorced, their spouse was, was unfaithful, and has been a divorce because of that. What are, they, what are they to do? How are they to view that? Why is immorality an exception? Well, immorality is an exception because marriage is a one flesh union. How much more clear could Jesus have been? One flesh, one flesh, one flesh. The sexual union is the picture of the commitment made, it's, it's, it's in the eyes of God, it's what cements that marriage together ultimately. Again, the commitment and the one flesh union. Adultery is to be one flesh with someone else. It's the most fundamental violation of the marriage covenant. As we said before, it doesn't end the marriage right away because marriage is a covenant. It has to be properly and, and officially terminated. So just the sexual activity doesn't end the marriage, but it ruptures it at the deepest level. Turn to 1 Corinthians 6. We've looked at this. But turn there so you can see it. And reminding again that being involved sexually, physically with someone else is a very serious violation because it is being one flesh with that person. Not getting married to them. It simply is is engaging in this special union with someone who isn't your wife or husband and is extremely serious. 1 Corinthians 6 where Paul is just working through the, just the rank evil going on in Corinth. I mean, wife swapping and prostitution. I mean, you name it. It's all there incest, ah, I mean, we we think we wrestle. Well, we do, but, I mean, this is at a different level. But he says to them, verse 14, or verse 15, do you not know, 1 Corinthians 6, that your bodies are members of Christ? And speaking specifically to believers, it's even that much more grievous for believers. Shall I take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. May may that never happen. Why? Why is this such a grievous evil? I mean, it's it's just a physical activity. That's what they were arguing in Corinth. It's just a physical deal. It's no big deal. Your body eat, you eat food. That's this is the same. You you have sex. Paul says it's not the same. It was designed for something entirely different. So he says this. Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body, one flesh, with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. You have ruptured your marriage covenant at the most fundamental and serious level by becoming one flesh with someone else. That's why this is a lot. That's why an exception is made. There's no other sin like this. And we'll talk about, again, we'll talk about other kinds of sins, how that might lead ultimately to the dissolution of a marriage, but this is most fundamental. Now, flowing out of that, all right, under the law, adultery, sexual immorality, physical sexual activity with someone not your wife, would require that the person be be killed, be stoned. Now, that's whether the person was repentant or not. So a husband goes and commits adultery against his wife, says, I'm really sorry for that. Yeah, we're sorry that you're sorry. The law says you die. Now, God didn't always, he he let David go, he gave grace at times, but that was what the law was for. It said, you will die, whether you repent or not. And so when that was the case, hear me carefully. The innocent party was always free to remarry. They were free. They, they, that, that adulterous partner was gone. They were dead. That's what the law demanded. And so that's why this exception is allowed, because we don't kill people under the new covenant. But we allow well, someone who's been sinned against in this way, we do not require them to have to stay with the one who violated the marriage in this way. The law didn't. It allowed them to be released because that person was to be killed. I just, let me just remind you, Leviticus 20.10. If there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, or who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. As clear as could possibly be that that was to be the case. Now, uh, and then, by the way, the, the idea that remarriage was right and good and acceptable when someone had died is found in Romans 7. It's also found in, in the Old Testament. But Romans 7.2 for the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. 
But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she's joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's freed from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Now, again, under the new covenant then, divorce does not bring with it the death penalty. So grace is extended to both the adulterer and to the innocent party for them to be able to pursue what is right and good. For the adulterer, what's the grace? He doesn't or she doesn't die. That's great grace, and let's not forget that. They're already getting grace because they no longer have to be killed. They no longer are forfeiting their lives. And of course, there is great grace extended to the innocent party so they can be released from the adulterer and remarried in purity. What would have happened automatically under the law is granted by Jesus, is granted under the new covenant because that person is not required to be killed. And they, if it, is, if it seems best in that situation, may end the marriage and remarry in purity and remarry someone who is pursuing purity. What great grace. And who are we to say that this exception or exemption clause is somehow unbiblical or unright? Or are, are we, are, do we have greater righteousness than Jesus? Do we think it's more important for us that we would say, well, they can't do it. He said that that's possible. Why? Because it is full of grace. Now, some clarifications. Immorality, when someone commits immorality, it does not require divorce. Again, notice, there's not a command here. It says, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and remarries another commits adultery on that side. But it doesn't say that when there's been adultery, you have to divorce. Just like in Deuteronomy 24, it didn't, wasn't commanding the men to get divorced. It was permitting what had happened by making, by, by providing for the one who had been harmed. Well, in this case, it's not required. So when there has been adultery or been immorality, it is not, it is not the first thing. Well, okay, well, now you have to end the divorce. Right? You have to get it. No, in most every case, if there is repentance on the part of the spouse who has committed immorality, committed adultery, then in almost every case it's going to be better to try, if they're repentant, to work to keep the relationship together and to try to help them progress through that to save and, and, and rescue the marriage. In almost every case, that's going to be best. So this is not a prescription that it is necessary to divorce if there is immorality. Some have taken it that way. You've committed adultery, boom, we're done. I have to divorce you. No, you don't. There can be, and where there is true repentance, there most often should be a pursuit of reconciliation. Why? Because it is an extension of even greater grace. They've already received grace, but it's an extension of even greater grace. Now, if the adulterer is repentant, not continuing in their behavior, zealously pursuing what is right, then in almost every case, we work hard at reconciliation. And this is generally... Now, it, it, repentance is generally clear-cut. That is when there's real repentance. That's pretty obvious to see. 2 Corinthians seven ten is clear. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, and here's, here's what it looks like when someone really repents of any sin and certainly of sexual sin. What, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you? What vindication of yourselves? What indignation? I hate that because it violated the, the nature and character of God. It harmed my wife. What fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong in everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent of the matter. This is not repentance and someone's like still dallying with that sin, not going to get rid of things, blaming their spouse, saying, well, you made me do this. Self-pity, I can't believe this is happening to me. How can you be persecuting me like this because I, I was an adulterer? That's not repentance. And sometimes it takes a while to figure that out and to work your way through that and you help a spouse work their way through. Is there true repentance? Sometimes it takes years to determine this. We've spent sometimes six years, seven years working with someone to determine uh, who as a husband or wife is wrestling in this area to determine, okay, is there real repentance? As they come back and as they say they have repented from this. But oftentimes there comes a time when we determine that there's, that's not real repentance. And that's not always when the guy leaves or when something else happens. He might want to stay, but he doesn't want to repent. So this can get very complex when there's not repentance. But when there's true repentance, it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear to the spouse. And it's pretty clear to the church when there's real and true repentance. And we rejoice when the Lord rescues and saves those marriages. And we will do everything we can to seek to put that back together. But, so, immorality does not require Divorce, but I, I will say it this way. Grace does not require reconciliation. It does not require it. I don't look at a, a woman or a man in the eye who's, whose spouse has committed adultery and say, hey, you, you have to reconcile. Because I don't believe scripturally I can do that. It's not required. 
See, the adulterer, again, has already been given grace. They're still alive. They have an opportunity. Maybe that adultery is representative of a heart that has not responded properly to God, and they're on the way to hell. So God has given them grace to not allow them to, to die so that they can come to Christ and live. That's a lot better than keeping your marriage. Sometimes it's all the man or the woman wants. I just want to keep my marriage. How can I do that? No, you need to see if you know Jesus. You need to stay alive so that you can come to Christ. That's a lot more important than you keeping your marriage and your family, as important as that may be. But oftentimes that's the only thing focused on, which often means a lack of repentance. They don't care about their walk with God. All they want is to get their marriage back. It's not repentance. Ben says, look, I, I, I'm, my, my state before a holy God is primary. So it's not required that there be reconciliation. The adulterer has been given great grace to have committed adultery and to be alive and to allow and to be forgiven and to be able to continue on in what's going on. Now, while it is certainly true that grace can be extended to an adulterer, that divorce is not required, the exception for adulterer, remember, also provides grace to the one sinned against. They're not required to receive the adulterer back. And remember that receiving an adulterer back into a marriage is not the same as simply being reconciled to another member of the body of Christ, as difficult as that may be. I sometimes hear that said, look, you know, I've got to reconcile with other members of the body of Christ, so you need to reconcile with your husband. It's not the same. You don't have to welcome that person back into your bed. You have to be sexually intimate with them over and over and over again as is required in marriage. You don't have to do that with any other member of the body of Christ. So don't cheapen what it requires to forgive and to work through adultery by simply saying, look, that's, everybody's got to do that. No, they don't. As in, if I am, you know, lack reconciliation with you as another member of the body of Christ, oh, I need to be close relationally, but not physically. I'm not required to do that. There's a different level of intimacy. Be careful of just telling someone, hey, you just need to do that. And we've got to forgive and forget. Ooh, we're talking about the sexual intimacy of marriage. It's going to take some time to work through. You're going to have to, we're going to have to work through those things. By the way, God's grace did not require him to stay married to Israel. If it is always wrong to divorce, I'm going to wrestle with God's spiritual portrayal of what he did with unbelieving Israel. That is, the ten tribes. Remember, they divided into two when the kingdom was ripped apart. Israel, the ten tribes of the north, and Judah and Benjamin, uh, called Judah, usually the two tribes in the south. And, and the spiritual adultery, really of which, in one sense, physical adultery is a, is a picture. The much worse sin is spiritual adultery. Oh, by the way, that might be some of you. Spiritual adultery is to worship anything other than the living God, to bend the knee to anyone other than Christ. That's a lot worse sin than physical adultery. And it will end up in eternal hell. So that, that might be something to think about, how quickly we are to judge these people who are involved in physical adultery. There's people who have never committed physical adultery who, have, who are spiritual adulterers. And that sin will send them to eternal hell. Spiritual adultery is the worst sin. It's the fundamental sin. And so in the picture of this idea of immorality and how God responds as a husband, Jeremiah 3.8 is clear. I saw that for all her adulteries, all the adulteries of faithless Israel, that's prostituting herself before other gods, he says, I sent her away, I've given her a writ of divorce. Why? Because she was unfaithful. That's the exception. If there's unsexual unfaithfulness, in this case spiritual adultery, then it is the right of God to give this writ of divorce. That's exactly, Jesus is saying in the physical realm, that's exactly what we're talking about. You, there is this right when there has been adultery. The fact that he did not exercise. Now, what's interesting is for Israel, he exercised this right. He said, no, no more. You're done. With Judah, fascinatingly enough, he did not write her a certificate of divorce. She, the, those two tribes, again, spiritually in the metaphor, she continued on doing even worse things. And in Isaiah 50, thus says the Lord, where is the certificate of divorce by which I've sent your mother away? Or to whom? Of my creditors did I sell you? You were sold for your iniquities, your tra for your transgression, your mother was sent away. They were claiming they got a divorce. And he said, no, I haven't. To Judah. He says, the reason I sent you away was to punish you for your iniquities. And, and here's another thing to carefully think about when we quickly tell a woman or a man, look, you need to stay in that marriage because God does. I mean, do you understand what it meant for him to stay with Judah? What he put her through as a result of her spiritual adultery? Something that no spouse could ever do to their, or would ever do to their, to their own spouse? I mean, when he says, I sent her away, he didn't, he didn't divorce her in that sense, but he sent her away. I mean, you understand what that means? The destruction of Jerusalem, the starvation of the people, the eating of their own children, the butchery of thousands, the captivity of nearly the entire nation? That's a pretty severe grace. So say, oh, just open, you know, open arms, just open that person, accept that person back in. That's not even how God operates when he extends this grace. 
We need to be very careful of applying what only God can do. And yet we have a picture even or principle here that for immorality, even God in that sense had the right or the, under the law and, and even in his own, even under grace, he had the right to divorce her. Now, some people will point to Hosea and say, well, well look, in, in Hosea, he takes a prostitute and then she continues her prostitution and he goes back to marry her. That's true. It's an unbelievably beautiful picture of God's faithfulness. But it's not a really great illustration of human marriage. And you want to be pretty careful of trying to apply Hosea and Gomer to someone say, look, you need to be Hosea and Gomer. I don't think so. Right? God told Hosea to go marry a prostitute. We are never going to give that advice, ever, ever. And if someone is actively involved in prostitution out in the city, we're not going to say, hey, be better quick, run back and marry them again. There's going to be a lot of work that goes on there. So be careful of just taking that kind of carte blanche and applying it to someone who's wrestling with an adulterous spouse and saying, well, God did that. That's a very unique example. That is something only God can do. The prophets, by the way, did all kinds of things that we would not emulate. Lying on their side for 365 days, cooking with dung. I mean, you, you want to be careful of using a prophetic illustration to say a marriage ought to be like that. It shouldn't be like that. Again, their principles. Applying grace is incredibly important. And, and when we can and when that's appropriate and right and good, we should. But please understand that grace has already been applied to the adulterer even if he never or she never receives their marriage back. That's not the primary grace. It will be a secondary grace if that is possible. One, one final thought here. Remember Joseph. Joseph was married to Mary. He said, well, he's no betrothed. No, in, in that society, and it's clearly laid out both in Old and New Testament, the betrothal was marriage. That is, you, they hadn't physically consummated, but it was considered legally to be a marriage under the law. And when Joseph found out that Mary was with child, what did he assume? That she was an adulteress. And what, what does the scripture say? Being a righteous man, he desired to what? Put her away. The, that's divorce. He was righteous. And he said, I, I don't want to pursue my marriage with someone who has been adulterous. That was his choice. He could do that. And he was going to do that. Now he finds out what? That she wasn't an adulteress. And he marries her. But it wouldn't have been unrighteous for him to set her aside. Well, I mean, what's the moral of the story? Don't commit adultery. Do not violate your marriage in that way. You might receive your spouse back. If you, and as you repent with a humble heart, it may be the grace of God to restore you back to that marriage, but he's not required in any way to do that. So please be careful and do not do not break your marriage vows and do not... It's funny, we, we think marriage is almost, you know, divorce is so rampant, it's like, well, we've treated marriage poorly. We've also treated adultery almost as a little thing. When we instantly tell someone, I know he committed adultery, you better get back with him quick. Really? Like adultery is no big deal. It's a huge issue. Not insurmountable. It's a big deal. It has huge physical consequences. So please, guard your marriages. And of course, then, as I've already said, divorce for immorality allows the innocent party to remarry. If it wasn't wrong to divorce, it's not wrong to remarry. If the spouse would have been dead, then certainly remarriage was an option and would have been in every case. And that's when there has been this exception where the husband or wife has committed adultery, then the wife or husband may divorce and they may remarry. And this is God's great grace. Who are we to be less gracious than God when it comes to this? Now, by the way, again, it's a pretty narrow restriction we're not opening up marriage for any kind of divorce for anything at all. Now we're going to discuss next week one final e exemption, as it were, one other way in which divorce becomes acceptable for the abandonment by an unbelieving spouse. And that will help us understand abuse and all these other things. We're going to go there, but right now Jesus is making this pretty simple. And I think even the exception clause, allowing it for morality, is pretty simple. I, again, we've got to work our way through it, but I think we would understand that a violation for sexual immorality would be a reason why a marriage could be dissolved. Now, a word of caution. Be careful of reading your own experience into biblical principles. If you committed adultery and truly repented and your spouse received you back and your marriage is restored, that's a great joy. But don't read your situation into everyone else's. It's difficult sometimes to determine where there's been real repentance. It's hard to know what's going on in someone else's life, so be very careful. But on the flip side, don't somehow 
you know, view the seriousness of adultery, hear, hearing me say that and seeing the scriptures, and the exception that it allows for divorce, and don't let that somehow become a reason for you to refuse to see repentance in a spouse who might have sinned in that way. Well, you know, Chris said it was really serious, the Bible says it's serious, uh, and you get no grace. No, don't read it that way either. If there's true repentance, you should work towards reconciliation. You're not looking for an opportunity to divorce your spouse. I've seen that happen where there's kind of waiting, kind of pressing, trying to get the spouse to sin in that way so they can undo the marriage. I mean, that's wicked. So neither way, neither response to that would be appropriate. Using wise discernment and biblical principles, we will carefully pursue all sides of this issue in order to work through the difficult cases when adultery happens, and there are many. But, but here's, here's my urging to you. One, if, if you're an unbeliever, you're, you're a spiritual adulterer, and you need to run to Jesus. It's much worse in its consequences even than physical adultery. Instead of judging other people, you need to run to Jesus and, and worship him alone. Repent of your spiritual adultery. For all of us here, right, if, if you've committed adultery, then you need to seek God for repentance. You need to run to him. If you, or if you're in a marriage that, that you entered into in an adulterous fashion, you need to repent. You need to seek the Lord. Find his forgiveness and don't ignore it. If you've not committed adultery, then, well, what, of course, what's the call? Protect your marriage. And if you're not married, protect your future marriage. Is there any... Let, let me ask it this way. Is there any issue in your thought life, your words, or your actions which would harm your marriage or your future marriage or violate the sanctity of marriage in general? Is there anything, that secret stuff you do at night those r- romances that you allow to run through your head that, you know, that you just, you, oh, I just love to be romantic and yet it's starting to pull you away from your husband because he's not very romantic. Is anything harming the sanctity of marriage? Would it be that never again at Grace Community Church would there be unchastity? Never again would that be the case. And that would take a miracle of God. But should we pursue that? We should. And that's what I pray will come out of the stronger marriages Stronger commitment to marriage, better preparation for marriage, better maintenance within marriage, better love of our, our spouses, better, better prayer for all of us for the marriages, better participation, better counsel, everything. This is incredibly practical, but the doctrine matters. And getting scripture right matters. I, I, let me ask you, will you get serious about marriages, about your own, about your impending one? We'll talk about single, any of those things. So that God will be honored so that his grace for overcoming sin would be abundant in our congregation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of the word of God that you have given to us that we can know and understand how to respond to marriages, how to respond when they are violated, how to respond when people would wish to end them when they shouldn't, how to help protect and guard the marriages that you have so, so graciously granted to us and how to extend grace properly, how to love properly, how to forgive and, and respond and restore. I want to pray that in every marriage, in every person, there would be here a, a pursuit of purity, a longing for holiness, a longing to fulfill the picture of Christ in the church that is so beautiful as we live out our maleness and femaleness and, and our sexuality and manners that are pleasing and honoring to you. Lord, help us be a congregation that shines brightly in this area. In your precious name, Lord Jesus.